Dear friends, and now we have the totally unique speaker, one of the best in the world researchers of the economic theory, economic history and politics, a Norwegian professor, Eric Reinert. He has the best in the world economic education, MBA of the Harvard University, a PhD of Cornwall. He has a fantastic and practical experience of the leading of industrial enterprises. And he was working as an economic consultant and expert in more than 60 countries, just think, 60 countries of the world. Moreover, he's an author of the translated into more than 20 languages bestseller how the rich countries became rich and why the poor are staying poor. By the way, this book is included in top 50 of the most influential economic books of the last century by the version of the World Association of the Economists. The library of Professor Reinert, his personal library, has, how do you think, how many books? More than 40,000 of economic books. Moreover, he is working with them and focuses upon the best world experience which can be used by Ukraine today to speed up its economic development. Professor Reinert is not working uh, for the international uh, monetary fund or the government of any country. That's why he can afford himself this luxury to be totally frank and sincere and to be the real scientist. That is why his thoughts and advice are incredibly valuable for us. So this public discussion with Professor Reinert will be moderated by the prominent Ukrainian economist, professor of the Institute of International Relationship or Relations of the University named after Taras Shevchenko, the Doctor of Economic Sciences and the author of the concept Neo Dependency, Natalia Reznikova. So, dear Professor Reinert, dear Ms. Natalia, I do invite you here to the stage. Dear audience, dear students, really we have today a colossal honor to allow ourselves, to afford ourselves to be sincere, first of all, with ourselves. The questions which I will pose for Mr. Reinert are not only, well, like would make him find the proper words, they won't be this informal for us not to be that disappointed. I'm sure that Mr. Reinert's answers will inspire us and will assure us that everything will be okay eventually. Dear Professor, good day. Well, really, Viktor Galasuk has multiple times emphasized that Today, Ukraine is the donor of the raw materials, the export of human capital, export of talents, export of thoughts and opinions. For those countries which have already become rich and the history of the achievement of this success, which you analyzed on the pages of your books, the growing import, the necessity to serve the state debt, uh, the flows of the shadow capital into offshores means the loss of the money for Ukraine. Simultaneously, the EU countries have more and more active appeals to have state support, to create companies, national champions, to describe companies which will be budget forming. So those market failures and unfair competition and social pressure create a request to have the whole revision of the state. Mr. Reiner, during the latest years, manipulating the financial dependency of Ukraine on the countries who are partners and who are simultaneously our donors, in fact, we are blocked with the economic policy which would give an opportunity for all of the structural transformations of our state. Would you please tell? 
which should be the policy, which having the definitions of Viktor Kalasuk will finally get rid of the raw material disease and which profession should the state choose and all together each of the students and of the present is. Thank you. Well, uh, I have a problem here because I hear two languages at the same time uh, and I only understand one of them. Um, so there is a technical problem. Uh, uh, so I don't know if it's here or, 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 or somewhere else. So we speak in English sometimes. Yes. So, so could you perhaps very briefly repeat the question? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think that I have to uh, pay the attention of the students and uh, all of us who are today uh, here. So maybe you want to uh, tell us uh, what uh, kind, what type of uh, economic policy for Ukraine is uh, more uh, comprehensive uh, for, uh, for, uh, for for today's uh, needs. Okay. Well, I think I think we are uh, in a state of world confusion of about economic policy. Um, and I think that's good news for the Ukraine. I think it's good news for the Ukraine that both the presidential candidates in the United States, Sanders from the left and Trump from the right, agreed that free trade is not really necessarily in the interest of the United States. So that makes it much more, uh, much easier for you to say that, well, perhaps it's not always in the interest of of, of, of the Ukraine either, right? So, so we are at a turning point. And I wrote a paper for the United Nations in 2009 when I talked about uh, 1848 moments. You know, 1846 was the big uh, uh, victory of free trade all over the world. The English stopped protecting their agriculture, and we thought there was a big future for free trade. Then uh, comes a financial crisis in England in. 1847, a bad harvest in most of Europe in 1848, and you get revolutions in all big European countries except Russia and England. And the interesting thing which is, happens there in 1848, it's essentially the same time, same thing that happened in the United States, that both the right and the left uh, leave the belief in free trade. Right? We have 1848, you had Marx and Engels uh, on, uh, to the left, and to the right you had John Stuart Mill the, the uh, great English liberalist who actually said that all nations needed to industrialize and they all needed infant industry protection. So I think here is uh, where uh, we are today and I think that, that is good news for the periphery. That, that, you know, we can say what you want about Trump, uh, but he managed to stop the hypocrisy about free trade. Right? That's the good thing about him. And, and I think uh, Africa should say, well, we also need uh, to protect the industry. And I think what is key, was the key here is, is the link between economic structure and po population carrying capacity. Right. Um, so if you can elaborate a bit on, on this. Um, in uh, 19... 45, the Allied uh, uh, decided to punish Germany for having made two wars. And the worst punish punishment they could think of was the, um, to deindustrialize Germany. So they, they prohibited industry in, 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 in the Allied zones, in the, in the French, English, and US zones, and, uh, but not in the Russian zone. So when industry died out, people started moving from West Germany to East Germany because in East Germany there were still jobs. So this was a big problem seen from Washington that 
uh, actually it seemed that communism was winning. So they send out a wise man to, 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 to Germany, Herbert Hoover, and he writes back, there's only one problem with the deindustrialization of, uh, of, of Western Germany, it's that there will be 25 million people too many. What should we do with the 25 million Germans? Should we, should we exterminate them or should we move them somewhere else? If, if so, where? And I think this is, the key under, this is the key understanding that gave us the Marshall Plan. And the Marshall Plan was to re-industrialize. Right? And, and the Marshall Plan was not only Germany, it was Western Europe, it was Southern Europe, it was uh, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan. And what the West did was very su successfully to make a sanitary belt of rich countries around communism, and that stopped communism, right? Uh, and it increased the population carrying capacity. And what, what you're now seeing in the Ukraine, I think it's very important that, that we, we link two key problems, the problem of deindustrialization and the problem of migration, right? Uh, and, and one is the, the cause of the other. Deindustrialization is the cause of, 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 of migration. And this is what the Americans understood so well in, in, in 1947, when they created the Marshall Plan. So, uh, and what we're seeing now in the United States uh, is also a result of the deindustrialization of Central America and of Mexico. So, so the, the people in the, uh, who lost their jobs in the industries that died out there are moving north. And this is something, this is such a key variable and, and it's not, uh, it, it isn't really recognized. So I think this is a good starting point. And um, the problem of uh, the industrialization also, also leads to uh, problems of, uh, of, of finance, right? That you get big trade deficits. I think you mentioned the financial uh, side of it. So um, a problematic thing is that some of the things that we, sh that we saw in the 1930s are, are uh, popping up again. Uh, and one of the things we saw in the 1930s was, um, uh, which actually was an important reason for the, for the Nazis to come to power in Germany, uh, was that they were falling into, heavily into debt. Right? And uh, the German term was Zinsknechtschaft, or, or um, uh, debt uh, serfdom. So the Germans were complaining that they were falling into debt serfdom, and that caused p political uproar. Uh, the sad thing now is that the, the, uh, the uh, periphery of the European Union, I mean, from the industrialized Portugal to Italy to above all Greece, are falling into this same debt trap. But this time, the G Germany is on the, uh, is on the other side. It's the huge export surplus of Germany which creates the deficits, which, which contributes heavily to the deficits in these countries. And, and, and we have, uh, we, we have uh, Germany's export surplus and we have the periphery of Europe locked into Euro. They can no longer devalue. And if they cannot devalue, what, can, what do they do? Well, the only adjustment factor is to move people. Right? So, 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 uh, in, in a sense, it's good news for the Ukraine that you're no longer alone in this. You know, you actually look more like Italy or 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 or, or, or Greece or, or or Portugal. I think I think that is good news. And and what's coming out of this is that um, people are now discovering um, what Keynes used to call the paradox of savings. If you're heavily into debt then um, if you start saving, your economy will shrink. So in a sense, the worst thing you could do if you're heavily into debt is to start saving, because the, then the economy shrinks even more. And this, Keynes understood it, and Keynes since today understand it, but Brussels seems not to understand it. So they're trying to force Italy into exactly that pattern. So 
the good news for you is that you're less alone. No, your, 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 your problems are becoming more, uh, more, uh, more, more usual, which is bad news for Europe, uh, for the periphery of the European Union, but I think, in a sense, it's good news for you. Would you please tell, when you were speaking about the problems of deindustrialization, we understood that the developed world has already responded on the understanding of those risks. And in February 2019, the Ministry of Economy of Germany, Pepper Altmaier, announced the National Industrial Strategy of 2030, which includes the lists of certain private companies, the survival of which is now are the national, I do emphasize national interests, both political and economic interests. It is foreseen to create the state fund which will be in the role of the Institute of uh, Interference in case when the Germans understand that their companies cannot provide the championship at the market. When Mr. Minister was asked how it is correlated with the notions of free market, free competition, and so on, he answered that these principles will be still the basic ones, but we will deal with them only when the German companies will be able to be championship uh, champions and to have the most innovative markets. Mr. Reinert, would you please tell? What about this combination of not only double standards, it's even beyond that, because some of the countries of Europe are now obliged to have one faith, faith of free markets, into this invisible hand of a free market which will solve everything. In fact, such countries like we, including Ukraine, we are told, you don't have to regulate anything. Nothing depends on your state. There's no use of your state. The market will do everything on its own. Would you please tell those double standards in the EU, let alone Ukraine, will they become the reason for their implementation of disintegration tendencies in the EU? Thank you. Well, I think this is a very important question. And I think the, the answer to that is, is that uh, uh, colonial powers have always had one rule for the mother country and one rule for the colonies. And for hundreds and hundreds of years, the, the, the key of colonialism, the, the, the key economic point of colonialism was to prohibit uh, manufacturing industry in the colonies. You know, this is a main reason why the United States in 1776 decided to, uh, they, they decided to become independent. So, unfortunately, we are again, uh, I think, into a period of colonialism. And, and the problem, as you explained it well, is the rhetoric reality gap, right? The, the rhetoric is you, the periphery, behave according to, uh, to the rules of the market. If you, if you just stop being uh, corrupt, the invisible hand will do everything. Don't worry, right? Mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what they tell us. Uh, but in reality, they are, in fact, uh, protecting their own manufacturing industry. Unfortunately, it now, it's now becoming obvious. But, but, but this is the classical colonial policy. You know, this is what England did for hundreds of years to their colonies. So we, we, we just have to call it, I think, by its right name. And the rhetoric reality gap, you've had it for, for more than 100 years in the United States. You know, uh, uh, we have Thomas Jefferson on one side who said, you know, the best, go the best government is the government that governs the least. Well, he changed his mind slightly when he became president. And on the other hand, you had Alexander Hamilton, the guy on the $10 bill, who, who, who actually uh, wrote an industrialization plan from the, for the United States, presented to the Senate in, in 1791, eight reasons why we should have a manufacturing industry. I have my students read Hamilton every, every, every year. So uh, the rhetoric in the United States has been Jefferson, do nothing, right? This is what you tell your colonies in quotation mark. Uh, but the, the practice has been Hamilton. So, so in, in, in a sense, what Germany is doing is doing exactly the same thing as, 
as, as, uh, as the America used to do. Rhetoric, uh, free, free trade, practice, something very different. And if you think of, um, if you look at the agricultural sector, and, and you ask yourself, why is it that the most efficient agricultural producers in the world in Western Europe and in the United States still need heavy subsidies and, and still need protection? Well, if you, ask, if you answer that question, if you try to answer that question, you will understand that um, uh, no country can be rich based on, on agriculture. I can, I can explain why if we have time but it has to do with diminishing returns and, 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 and perfect uh, competition, which is very different from, 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 from industry. So, so that, that, that the bluff is getting clearer, I think, is, is in everyone's advantage. Mm. Well, thank you. You see, dear students, there is one truth which is in the textbook and there is a different truth. And it needs to be consideration, considered. Thank you, Victor, what you're doing and that you're doing that possible, looking at all those provisions. Dear Professor, once in one of the interviews to our newspapers you said that Industrialization is the best treatment against corruption. And really, this topic is always discussed in our society. Moreover, the society is waiting for some precise steps and affairs which would witness that we begin the movement to the treatment of this disease, final treatment. But when we look at the topic of the today's meeting, which economic policy is profitable for the country, we understand that the corruption has the economic effects and what is going on in the economy leads to corruption. But if we look deeper, one of the social effects of corruption is the decrease of the welfare of each of us. So if we speak about the economic policy which is implemented in that bad way without taking into consideration the modern tendencies, if the position of the country is not stood for at the negotiations playgrounds, and we, the nation, we understand that the interests of the state are just given away, would you please tell? Does the history have any cases, the history of the development of the countries which are reached today, the cases when the state officials which gave away the interests of their state would be taken to court? Thank you. If we analyze corruption, it's one of the very long shadows of feudalism, uh, where where uh, uh, normal subjects, normal human beings were subject to arbitrary power. Right? So it's the arbitrariness of the power which I think is an inheritance uh, from feudalism. And in these countries uh, you also have um, a heritage from the communist era. There's a very important, interesting book written by a Russian-American uh, called When Money Dies. And, and uh, what you found, I think, during the, 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 the Soviet system uh, was that uh, to make things function, people had to barter things between themselves, right? And e even if you had, were running an industrial company and, and you didn't get the material from the state that you should do, well, you had to barter with, 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 with other people. So I think it's, it's this mixture of feudalism and then and then the, the habits that were created by the non-functioning plants. Uh, I ran uh, an industrial company in three countries in Europe for, for a very long time, uh, in, for about 19 years in Italy. And if you ask yourself, well, if you come to Italy, uh, and everybody in the north will tell you that the, the south is so corrupt, and, and, and southern Italy normally starts 20 kilometers from where you are. You know, if, if you're in Milan, they say it starts at the River Po. If, you, if you're in Florence, they say it starts in Rome. If you're in Rome, it starts in Naples. But, but, but it's actually true that, that what we in the North would call corruption is much more common in, in the South. Uh, 
And that has an historical root. You know, Sicily was invaded by one country after the other, and they had to make some kind of secret network to survive, beginning of the mafia. Uh, but why did it die out in, in, in northern Italy? Well, I think it died out because northern Italy got industrialized from very, very early on. I mean, in, in the 1700s, Milan was, 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 was very industrialized. And then things start moving in a different way. So I, I stand with that argument that that uh, industrialization is actually the best way uh, to cure also corruption. You know, you, you, you get your living standards up. If your living standards in the city goes up, uh, it will attract uh, people from the countryside. Therefore, uh, labor in the countryside will also become more important. When, uh, more uh, wages will become higher also in the countryside. And wages are higher, suddenly it pays to mechanize agriculture uh, in, in, in the periphery, which it wasn't before, and you get into all these virtuous circles, which, in, which uh, are really the key of, of, of economic development. So I think your problems, the, the corruption, which often is theft, I think that's a very different thing. You should try to keep them apart. You know, theft from, from government is different from corruption. Corruption is, is, is paying for a service of some kind, right? So. The corruption, the migration, the deindustrialization are, 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 are three sides of the same coin, if a coin had three sides. But it's, it's, part, it's, it's part of the same problem, I think. Thank you. Would you please tell Mr. Reinert, you mentioned in all of your public speeches and scientific works that the development of the of industry has become the reason of the economic development of the countries which are rich today. Would you please tell? Do we have any discrepancies between your recommendations for Ukraine, for instance, about the renovation of the existing industrial constructions, I mean the implementations of the import replacement and the practice of the developed countries, which in fact has made them rich. Because, for instance, if we compare the Industrial Revolution of England why they made it? Because at the moment the industry was the most innovative branch. So would you tell, Mr. Professor, which sectors of economy do you see which would allow our state to implement the policy of re-industrialization but in the innovative spheres? which would give the opportunity for our state to achieve success, which could be similar to the success which was achieved by the Great Britain during the times of Industrial Revolution. Thank you. Well, on uh, innovations, I think we, uh, we must make it clear that there are also very important innovations in agriculture. But uh, the innovations in agriculture tend to bring down the prices to the consumer. They, you know, they, they don't raise the, the price to the farmers. And that is the reason why all farmers, even the most efficient one, needs, needs price support and, and subsidies. So uh, I think the Ukraine has a fortunate position in that it, it was very advanced, and it is, has, still has many uh, advanced sectors, and you have a fairly large population. I mean, the minimum efficient size of a nation has grown. In the 1930s, Estonia, with one million people, could have two bicycle factories and two factories of this and that, and they, could, uh, they were considerably richer than Finland. Uh, now, uh, the minimum efficient size is, is much bigger, and, and, uh, but you have almost uh, or around 40 million people, and, and that's, uh, that's a healthy population. Um, you know, if you are, you know, Latvia, just over a million people, um, they lost 20% of the population uh, when they deindustrialized, right? So, so, um, and, and, and uh, they also lost their, 
the, the farmers to a, a large extent. So, um, unfortunately, I think the, the, the answer is, is the same, uh, industrialization. And if you compare what England did, started doing in 1485, uh, how did they get rich? Well, the new king in 1485 uh, saw that uh, England was poor, but he had grown up in France where people were making textiles out of English wool. So if he had been at Harvard Business School, he would have said, we are in the wrong business. Right? And he started putting export duties on raw wool in order, and, and subsidies to uh, woolen cloth producers in England. And this is very similar to what you uh, have been doing here, you know, to, to uh, prohibit the export of raw timber in order to add value. Instead of, instead of uh, exporting uh, raw timber, you can export wooden furniture or whatever. And the same thing is with, with the scrap iron. You know, these are, these are um, uh, policies that are forcing, is, they're forcing the nation to add more value to the raw materials, and, 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 and this is the case. And here you see again uh, the, 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 the hypocrisy of, of, of the European Union. Uh, you know, the scrap iron doesn't go to the uh, uh, European Union, you know, you're not competing with the European Union in any way. You're making steel tubes and sending them to the Middle East, but they still protest, right? So this is part of the cheating. And, and, and I think uh, you will find that uh, in this turning point of economic policy, your signing of the treaty with the European Union was very unfortunate. You probably gave away rights that you should not have given away. In, in the history of Japan and China, there is something called the unfair treaties. And these were the treaties that the Chinese and the Japanese were forced to sign when the Americans and, their, their, um, uh, and the English came with their, with their gunboats and, and said, sign here, and they found uh, after a few years that they'd signed away their rights to have any industrial policy. Um, and, and, and I think this is unfortunately what you've done. I understand that the, the treaty is a, a 1,060 pages or something of that sort, and, and that very few people have read it. So, so you, have, uh, you have given away rights, and I think you should try to regain them. And I, on, on a very practical matter, I think if you look at your import bill, and see what is it that you could easily, where you could easily add value here. I wrote a paper for the European Union on smart specialization. So I would say, uh, if the Ukraine sells wheat to Italy for 400 euro a ton and imports spaghetti back for 4,000 euro a ton, that's stupid specialization, right? In the terms of I like the idea of the European Union with smart specialization because it, it actually means that there's the opposite also exists. There is something we could call stupid specialization. And this is what, what colonies are, are uh, being forced into. And I think the quote you have from, uh, from, from Germany is saying, well, they are developing industrial policy and, and we, 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 uh, then you should say, like, uh, like the Americans said in, in the 1820s, don't uh, don't do what the English tell you to do, do what, as the English did, you should say, don't do like the Germans tell you to do, do like the Germans do. Right? I think th this is uh, you know, learning from, from, from the leader and avoiding, avoid being a, a colony. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reinert. Recently, we are having in the economic policy of the developed countries there are certain attempts to give those policies the patriotic intention. For instance, Emmanuel Macron, in his electoral campaign and inauguration speech, he said that the best way to prove that you are patriot is to make everything for France to become competitive again. And competitiveness of France now is innovations, technologies, and the use of all of the advantages of digital era. So if we look at what is going on in the Great Britain, 
please, there are certain slogans, Great Britain, job places for the British. If we look at Germany, what they've done in Germany, made in Germany, this is also the internal support policy. In Ukraine, with the help of Viktor Valerievich, we've initiated several law drafts which allow to implement this patriotic mission. You should buy Ukrainian products. But not all of the society participants perceive this initiative. Would you please tell? What would you advise us Ukrainians to interpret what's really in the mainstream in the right way? What's correspondent to the requests of time? And how we, who understand the politics which is being implemented, how we can help the politicians who, in fact, are creating patriotic economic policy? Would you help us with your advice, please? Well, I think that um, we have had two cosmopolitical economic ideas. One was communism, and the other is neoliberalism. Right. They're, bo they're both cosmopolitical, in a sense. And um, what we saw in the 1930s was that the two most the two most recent state formations in Western Europe, Germany, who only got a, a law, joint law in 1897, and Italy, they went extremely nationalistic, right? You, have, you didn't have socialism, but you had national socialism. So I think the, the, the reaction to these uh, um, global theories, be they communism or neoliberalism, is um, the, the natural reaction is nationalism. But, but it has to be a kind of nationalism where you also recognize the rights of your neighbors. You know, it's not that uh, Armenia should grow rich uh, and, and, and Georgia should pay the bill. It's, it, it must be some kind of symmetrical nationalism. You, 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 you have to do it in, in a careful way that it's, it's not a, a negative sum game. It has to be a positive sum game that everyone wins. And in fact, after World War II, uh, with the Marshall Plan, you had a trade agreement which was called the Havana Charter. And the Havana Charter allowed nations that did not have full employment to protect their industry. It allowed um, nations that had an industrial plan to, uh, to, uh, have, uh, to protect their industry. And I think we have to get back to s certain rules like that. It shouldn't be that only the, the, the strongest, like Germany, should be allowed to have an industrial policy and, 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 and the periphery not. So I think we've all, you know, I grew up in Norway where, where, where uh, you know, I think the, the, the slogan was something like "Buy Norwegian if Norwegian is best," and 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 you know we we uh, I think we this limited kind of nationalism I think is healthy, but but it's 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 very problematic if it, it becomes too much. I think if you look at a, a, a country like Poland, their nationalism has been suppressed for such a long time that it kind of goes over the top now. So so. It, it, you, you, need, you need a balance, but, but, but by all means, um, use your nationalism, and especially if you buy things for the state. I think the most, what has shocked me most of, of the Ukraine in the last years is the locomotives bought from General Electric. You know, why, why use so much of scarce foreign resources? to buy something when you could have bought the technology for much less. I mean, this to me is inconceivable. And, 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 and if you, I think you have to teach the, 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 the public that, that foreign, uh, foreign exchange is a scarce resource. It's, it's always been. In Latin America, uh, they stopped importing 
um, because of the breakdown of the capacity to import, the lack of foreign exchange. The foreign exchange was so scarce when I was a kid. So I remember that you know, my, when my father was going abroad, he had to go to the bank, and the bank stamped in his passport the money he took out. So scarce was foreign, uh, foreign resources in Norway after the war. And private people could only buy cars after 1960 <laughs> because foreign exchange was scarce. Now we have the problem that Mario Draghi is printing so much money and there's so many people out there willing to lend you money that you're falling into this debt trap, right? You, 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 you're, falling into, uh, you, you're falling into the Zinsknechtschaft. And, and, and you should be, I think, very aware of that. Uh, you shouldn't stop, you, I think sooner or later Greece will go bankrupt and, 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 and other countries will go bankrupt. You know, even England uh, has gone bankrupt. I mean, the state of England has gone bankrupt once. So, so uh, sooner or later, you will, you will be able to start again, I think, with a, with a clean slate, but you know, play it by ear and, and, and see how, how other countries are doing. So yes, um, be nationalistic without, within limits, but also recognize other countries' right to do exactly the same. I think this is, this is, this is the key thing, kind of symmetrical <laughs> nationalism. Uh, Mr. Reinert, thank you so much. And also, I can see we've got some time left, so we can have one or maybe two questions. And they are the following. Recently, the research center of the magazine The Economist has published a so-called trajectory of the movement of Ukrainian economy up till 2050. Well, of course, some people joke that futurism is just the best, because in 2050 no one will remember about this forecast. So you can afford yourself to have mistakes, and thanks, and God forbid for this forecast to have be full of mistakes, because we have the growth annually only for one percent so we'd like it to be a mistake but for seeing the population extent it will be shorter up till 32 million and i'm interested which part of these 32 million will be abroad and how much will be left here in the state so really the forecasts are disastrous so coming back to the name of our today's topic, I mean, which should be the proper economic policy? Would you please tell, Mr. Reinert, is it uh, the verdict for our economy? Or maybe we still have certain, either several top five, in your opinion, steps which have to be conducted by our state officials and governmental officials for the population to come back to Ukraine and for the speed of the growth is at the, an appropriate level for us to implement the strategy of the catching up economic growth. Thank you. The good news is that uh, forecasts are a bit like ast astrology, you know. If, uh, uh, it's, it, it, it's, uh, that was John. Uh, uh, that was uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, the Harvard economist, who said that economic forecasting makes ast astro astrology look scientific. So, so it's, uh, uh, and, and you see, it's just, you know, it's a present trend, and, and, the, and they just prolong the trend. So uh, you shouldn't take uh, that uh, too, 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 too seriously. Um, but uh, the, the, problem, the problem still subsists. And I think um, that you have to work systematically on this. You have to, you know, don't buy imports if your own goods are almost as good. If they're not as good as import, well, make them better, right? Remember that uh, even though Mr. Draghi is printing so, mon so much money, uh, uh, foreign exchange is essentially uh, still, still scarce. And 
there are things to learn also from from uh, Russia. There are many. There they made a, a lot of mistakes, but in the 90s, uh, Russia was importing chicken meat from the United States, and and they used to call it bush legs. Uh, some of you may, may may remember that, and with a very small change in the sanitary regulations and perhaps a very small tariff, they managed in over very few years to be self-sufficient in poultry. Right? So, so I think uh, if you go through your import bill and say, and, and look, well, what, where is it that with a minimum of effort we can um, be self-sufficient, we can increase this industry? right? And, 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 and wheat and pasta is, is an obvious example. Uh, your, your practice with timber and with scrap iron is good. And, and sunflower seeds, I understand you've also done a, a, a good job. Uh, but the problem, of course, is that uh, the European Union uh, also will not take your agricultural products to the extent that you want. right? So, so they're keeping your industry down, and they're keeping the agriculture down, and the only thing they're not keeping down is migra outward migra migration. So, so you, should, you should put all these facts together and call their bluff. And, and I agree with you that the statements, like the one made by the German minister, makes, 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 this, uh, thing, uh, makes, makes these things easier. But um, um, I think you have to go down on a lower level of abstraction and, 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 and look, at, uh, look at what you can do on your import side. And as I say, you know, you're very educated people. And unfortunately, with migration, the most educated are the ones who tend to, 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 to leave first. So, so uh, another important thing is to match uh, education with the opportunities that you have. I was at a technical university yesterday. And, and, and you know, I think they're doing a very good job in, in basic mathematics and things that, 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 that are in demand. Uh, of course, uh, it's tempting to say, let's go into information technology, but you're never going to be as, uh, as cheap as, as India. So, so it would have to be in special fields. But I think th there's certainly some special fields uh, where, where, where you can go into this. So um, as I said, in a sense, the good news is that you're, you're, you're less alone. <laughs> Uh, you know, the more more countries having having uh, your same uh, your, your same problem. So, uh, but uh, as Keynes used to say, when 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 uh, when when things were collapsing after World War One, he said that um, uh, when things when things look desperate, uh, the only thing you ha you can do is relentless truth telling, which will work in the end. And, 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 and I think um, uh, the, the fact that uh, Trump now has shown that the hypocrisy of free trade, uh, now that the Germans are showing uh, their colonial, you know, they, they were a failed colonial power before World War I, now I think with, with the euro, they clearly have a unique advantage. You know, if, if the euro was loosened, uh, you know, the, the German mark would skyrocket, and most other countries uh, would uh, would fall. And I think what what France is doing is is I don't think I think they're trying to behave like Germany, but they don't have a structure uh, like Germany. So I think France is essentially failing. You know, uh, uh, sending uh, sending the bill for for the, for making a green planet to to the poor. Uh, in the periphery is, is not a very good idea, and, and I think it's, uh, uh, that idea is, is collapsing too. So, so there are not many uh, good ideas around, uh, except the old ones, I think, which you can, which, which you can read in, 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 in books. And, and the chaos in England is, of course, uh, extraordinary. It's extraordinary that they have managed to make such a, a mess of, of their Brexit. So, Professor, thank you for this excellent discussion.
Дякую, шановний професор Райнер. Thank you, dear Professor Reinert and Miss Natalia, for such a wonderful discussion. I've got a pleasant piece of news. Ukrainian Association of the Club of Rome, together with our partners, are planning to publish a new common project, a book, the bestseller of Professor Reinert, How the Rich Countries Became Rich and Why the Poor Are Staying Poor. We have achieved a certain deal about that, so I think that we'll do that rather soon, and the book will see light. I think it should be the table book for every economist in Ukraine, every state official, and every educated person who is interested in economy. Thank you so much again. And I'd like to give the floor now to our next speaker, one of the brightest Ukrainian economists. Neokinsianist and the head of the Institute of Alexander Paul and the director of the Agency of Development of Dnipro, Vladimir Panchenko. Vladimir, the floor is yours. Good day. I'd like to be original. Now our presidential candidates are giving the urine and blood tests to define whether they are drug or alcohol addicts. So maybe now I should dance and sing to be more interesting than our presidential candidates. So I'm holding this book here. This is my book about the neo-protectionism. You can see it even in the name. Why do I show it? For it to be proved that I'm a scientist. And we'll speak now about the scientists here. It was known, mentioned that neoliberalism is evil. Would you raise your hands who considered neoliberalism is evil? Would you raise your hands if you consider that neoliberalism is good? Well, not that many hands up. We need to understand what neoliberalism is. So now I'd like to show you the following slide. We are having two unicorns here who are fighting each other between the wars, 1919-1939. We had the League of Nations and it stopped its existence a bit earlier after Hitler didn't listen to the advice of the international community. And neoliberalism, which we are criticizing today, in fact emerged not as an economic theory, though it was based on the economy, but they didn't want fascism to win and for the world war to begin. Unfortunately, it didn't work. You can see the white unicorn. This is the economic liberalism or neoliberalism, which has been developed then. And in fact, it has been developed to provide trade and not to have war. This is the foundation of peace. Moreover, this is the basics of the freedom of personality. Neoliberalism counteracted not the protectionism, though in the economic sphere it was like that. It counteracted Nazism and fascism, which used to be world evil. And the world evil was that the person is not free. If the person is not free, he or she will be in the aura of fascism, and people will begin to fight each other. I would like to try to mention some of the quotes from the speech of 1947. Where do I click the button? William Rappert, an extinguished professor of economics, was the head of the Institute of Stuff for the League of Nations, by the way. So when in 1939, because of the beginning of the Second World War, this institute was closed of the stuff. Everything stopped in 1947, after fascism was fought. Neoliberals had their own conference and William Rappert had his speech. He said the following. 
Economics can be viewed as either science concerned with objectively explaining how the market functions or as a policy that proposes how men may more effectively arrange their relationship and welfare. This is a kind of a neutral statement, as if it's from economy. But let's look how this quote goes on. Science, and we mean economic science, cannot be liberal or illiberal. In a sense, it cannot, the economic science cannot be anything but liberal. An economist may be learned or ignorant, intelligent or dull, profound or superficial, but he cannot be liberal or illiberal. Rather, if he is illiberal as a man of science, it means he dogmatically and intolerantly denies the rights attention. This is the economy. The rights of the liberty of thought. We cannot have the real science without liberalism. And the last phrase. You cannot say that the man of science is a person who is not liberal. I think that after that you can raise your hands and we can shout neoliberalism is good, neoliberalism is so good, as Muntian does at his preachers. Yes, this is a kind of a preach. We need to understand that the world was bipolar, that the world was fighting with an awful threat of fascism, and it couldn't be different. It brought neoliberalism as a dogma. You can see it's totally dogmatic. Maybe you can remember the Soviet times. During the Soviet times, what was told about Marxism? Marxist studies. Marx's studies was the right thing to do and cannot be one because it's the right one. This is the phrase. So when fascism was finally conquered, or, well, in fact, beat, it was replaced by whom? You don't see that. Communism. The Cold War started. So the quote which I mentioned of 1947 by William Rappert concerned the remnants of fascism, which was fought in Germany. And Professor Ryan has just told about that. But now it concerned communism. And it happened up till 1989, and even before that. Communism has reached its failure. But in 1989 it was totally ruined. So what do we have as a legacy, as a post-communist country? So how do I click that? Because I'd like to have the proper speed and it doesn't work. I'd like to dance and sing and it does not work. Where do I press? And where do I show? It doesn't work. So, when the communism was beat, the global capitalism said that we are living longer, richer, we have become more equal, we have stopped the war, we have the equal opportunities for men and women, we have the new technologies developed, the children can just study and not work at the factories, we have access to the public services, we will not suffer because of famine or hunger, and we we can see the whole world. Those are ten peculiarities of the capitalism. The quote of 2018, that's what was reached by capitalism. And what should we fight with? We should fight with communism in Ukraine. We need to fight communism. That is why this advice of the people from the Western world cannot stick and cannot reach the aim, because they consider us to be a post-communist country. If they considered us the country of the third world, I 
I will show what they would recommend. They would recommend to fight communism. That is why those advise privatization, secondly, to have the free pricing and then the open markets. That's it. We don't need anything. That's what's needed to be done to overcome fascism and then communism. But what happened with communism? As you can see, it is so small now. It is decreasing. So the threat of the communism exists. But it's not that awful. But who can counteract economic liberalism or neoliberalism and its dogmatic forms? The economic socialism, that's what I'd like to mention. The professor began to criticize nationalism and he said that there shouldn't be too much of nationalism. I'm speaking about the economic nationalism, I'm researching it, and I'd like to say that this is the, the alternative of neoliberalism, not fascism, not communism, but the economic nationalism, which grows and makes countries not just lagging behind, but developed. It foresees the use of different opportunities of stimulation and protection to develop the econ economic sectors. These means are deviating depending on the development level of economy. Whether this is the underdeveloped sector, then we need stimulation, and if the sector is developed enough, then we can use the expansion. The nations and the economy in this concept, in this theory, are unified in its development and they add to each other. And of course, Friedrich List, we mention about him all the time, who wrote The National System of Political Economy. Recently, I found his his quote, which tells us that power is more important than wealth. And I can even decipher it. Now I want Friedrich List to be this strong man, because it is important. And that's what he explains. This is the direct quote from Friedrich List, his national system of political economy. National power is a dynamic force by which new productive resources are opened out. Forces of production are the tree on which wealth grows and bears the fruit. Because the tree is more important than the fruit, it can bear more fruit. That is why power is more important than the wealth itself. The next point of this phrase, a nation by means of this power, this strength, doesn't only grow new productive forces, but also maintains itself in possession of those it owns. And the reverse of power, feebleness, which what Ukraine leaves under the conditions of any consultations and recommendations, this feebleness leads to the underdevelopment of something new. And also it loses the wealth, the power of production, civilization, freedom, and even national independence. And they are coming into the hands of those who surpass us in might. Those are the Trump's words. Friedrich List told that 200 years ago, and now Trump says that. By the way, Americans do not consider Friedrich List to be the founder of economic socialism. They have their own Friedrich List, and Professor mentioned about him, that's Alexander Hamilton. I was really surprised several months ago, I've been to the United States, and some of the businessmen were asked, do they know Hamilton? It turned out that they all know Hamilton. And so I asked, how come that economic socialism is known in the US? It turns out that they know him in a bit of a different point of view and from a different perspective. Still, I don't know how to work with that. We'll have music now. So it turned out Americans 
have even a musical. And this musical tells us how Jefferson is communicating with Hamilton, how Hamilton is counteracting at the presidential elections to tour, and unfortunately Alexander Hamilton was shot at the duel. But in fact, for the economist, it's really honorable to be shot at the duel, moreover, by your close friend with whom they couldn't find common grounds because they supported different candidates at the presidential elections. If we create such musicals in Ukraine, I would say that Ukraine has chances to survive. Because when Professor Reiner tells us and calms us down that we won't have 30 million of population in 2050, according to the estimates of Davos, in 2028, we'll have only 18 million. So the figures are much more scary. The national economy tells us about the national interests. This is the complex of economic aims and measures of the state and government to develop the economic development of the state. And they counteract the global interests, which in fact create the rules of the game, where you don't have those discrepancies in the market. In a simple terms, national interests is the development of the welfare of your own people through the development of your own production. And global interest is the development of the welfare of your own people through the development of the world trade. In this is the discrepancy and this total discrepancy. For instance, when the world trade is well developed, everything is okay. No, it isn't okay. This is the problem of discrepancies. And today we have this kind of economic doctrine like economic patriotism. It is to make it in a broken way that you cannot have too much of nationalism, but you cannot have too much of neoliberalism. Any dogma is harmful. It is just ruining. So the consensus between the abstract and the global aims and the internal aims of the state, responsibility of the governments in front of their people is the economic patriotism. Economic patriotism does not have the aim uh, to have this closeness. That's what we are blamed for. As soon as Viktor is speaking and criticizing that, he's criticized for the words by the Ukrainian. We're not speaking about the closeness. We want to stimulate the economic activities beyond. And the economic patriotism has certain privileges. Sometimes they don't concern the local business. It can concern the business which is here and opens the production here. If it is working for the good of the people, it will have the same stimulation. Because the economic patriotism, in comparison with economic nationalism, the actor is the human being. Everything is done for the person, and it is mentioned peculiarly. And, of course, a couple of last slides with the texts, where again we'll have music. Economic nationalism used protectionism. If you got acquainted with Friedrich List, if not, please read his cool book. I do advise you to, as well as the books written by Professor Reinhardt. So, economic patriotism is using neo-protectionism, which has lots of types and it is created to provide the development of your own production. I would like to say that liberalism, in fact, if we have this balance, the world does not counteract protectionism. Liberalism and protectionism are counteracted by a different thing. For instance, in the parliament of Ukraine, we calculated that neoliberalism will have approximately the same share. Давайте. So this is the test. Which economic system does this economic memorandum concern? Communist. 
populist. I'd like to say that this is more of the communist. This is just Bolshevik. This is the Bolshevism. This is what's told by, told by Professor Reinhardt. We have neoliberalism which leads us to Bolshevism. And this is the failure of the whole economic system. That is why let's study neoliberalism, but let's not have this dogmatism. Let's study economic nationalism, but not be dogmatics. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a bright example. But who doesn't know your works, I do advise you to read your books, and we could even begin with your wonderful article at the Economic Pravda website. Just find his articles online, and you will see a very bright illustration of what's going on and what was mentioned by Professor Reinert with Ms. Reznikova and what was mentioned by Volodymyr Grigorovich. And now, maybe I shouldn't introduce myself, but my name is Viktor Golasuk, you know me, and what I'd like to tell you today, and maybe to ask you even, and to show you. Could you show my presentation, the first slide, please? So just look at this graph. This is the GDP per capita of Ukraine, European Union and the United States of America. What is the GDP? Well, we are the economists know that this is the level of economic activity of the country. If we calculate it per capita, then we can compare and all of the columns. And what's interesting, this indicator was suggested to use by the emigrant from Kharkiv, Semen Kuznets, who came to the United States of America when he was 21 years old, and just in several years he had a speech in the Congress of the US and he has offered to use these indicators. Since then it's one of the mo most disseminated economic indicator in the world. We can see that this level of the charge of economic battery of our economy is five times weaker than the EU has and seven times weaker than the United States. What does it impact on? It impacts everything. It impacts the level of the wages and salaries it impacts the funding of education, healthcare, army, the whole world and the whole life of the country. The country with the low GDP per capita cannot be rich. People cannot be rich and successful there. The country will not be influential at the international arena. This is the bad piece of news. The good piece of news is that it is totally possible to correct. And Professor Ryan had mentioned about that. We could change the economic policy. It's totally um, real to boost the economy and to have the proper economic orbit. Would you please show the poll, the survey? I would ask you to express your opinion. Would you please go to the Telegram messenger and choose the chapter of surveys? Could you please input the number 1961, the number of the poll? So I'd like to ask you. We've got different options. What's the main driver of the economic growth? Please choose one option only. Would you please focus upon something? The only thing. As a state official, as an economist, as a governmental official, what would you choose? Because we've got different options. Someone says fight with the corruption. Anti-corruption is the most important. This is the first option. The second one is political stability. That is a clever option, right? Because you've, know, you've known lots about that. The first one is the ranking of the competitiveness of the country in the world ranking table. Whether the country is competitive in comparison with all the rest, this ranking is created by World Economic Forum, which is conducted by Davos. Then, the quality and accessibility of education. Education. And the last point is economic specialization. In fact, the structure of economy 
What is this specialization of this or that country? What's the technological level? Let's think what's the most important driver of the economic growth still. The ranking of competitiveness is a very interesting uh, indicator. Now it's leading so far because this is a kind of a common indicator, both of the quality of the infrastructure and quality of the institutions. It includes lots of things. It's full of authority. So the economic specialization is the level of technological complicated level of economy, the level of the development of production capabilities, uh, rule of law. Well, of course, this is the fair court system and the power of law, anti-corruption or fight with corruption, whatever you say, control of corruption and so on. The quality and accessibility of education. Well, of course, we need to deal with all of that, but still, if we choose the most important factor which has to define the economic success of the country. What is this factor is? We can see this voting still going on. We'll have our own voting here. And now I will show you what are the results of the international research which has been conducted by the professors of the Harvard University, uh, University and MIT. Which conclusions did they make? and what it pushes us to. It's interesting whether we'll have certain coincidences of those research of Harvard and MIT and the opinion of our audience. So let us have 200 votes and then we'll stop and look at the results. So far, the ranking of competitiveness is the first one, is the leader. The second place is taken by economic specialization, and the third one is rule of law. Okay, we have 200 and even more. So let's look. The, this is the result of our survey. The first place is the ranking of competitiveness. But what are the results of those interesting people? Hausmann and from Harvard and Hidalgo from MIT. And even today they created their special center of international development in Harvard University. And they are creating the well-known atlas of economic complexity. So I will tell you the most interesting thing that according to the results of this empirical analysis, the research of the real data, not just some theoretical concept which they logically proved, they took the real data and they calculated that. We have one factor here which is more influential than all the rest. And this is economic specialization of the country. Not the fight with corruption, not the level of education, and not even the ranking of competitiveness by the World Economic Forum. You can see here on the screen this factor. You can just compare it with the rest. You can see just this big gap. It's so powerful to explain economic growth in comparison with other factors. These are the research on the quality of the education, on the years spent at school, on the quality of institutional environment, on the fight with corruption and all of that. So we have substantially, by times, economic specialization of the country. Hausmann and Hidalgo say this is the complexity of the economy. If the country has the developed industry, if the country can develop lots of types of goods, which was mentioned by Professor Reiner today, then this economy has the high complexity and the high potential of growth, the high speed of growth, the high value added. This economy is successful. It automatically creates the huge GDP and huge economic threshold. If the economy is primitive and it produces not that enough of goods or maybe just raw materials, then this country is doomed to be one of the last until they change the economic policy and the structure of the economy as a consequence. So, in fact, this research of Hausmann and Hidalgo from Harvard and MIT totally approve what was mentioned by Professor Reinert and what he wrote in this bestseller, How Rich Countries Got Rich and Why Poor Countries Stay Poor. This is one of the approvals of this empirical 
proof. Moreover, it has a very simple explanation. Just look at the economic statistical data of Ukraine and the EU. What does our export consist of? And what does the EU export consist of? 79% of the export of the European Union is the industry products. They took some raw material, they created the ready products of that, and they sold all over the world. So their specialization, the profession of the EU is the producer. What's the profession of Ukraine? What's our economic specialization is? 70% of our export is raw material. All the goods with the absolute minimal level of processing. So the profession of the EU is the producer. The profession of Ukraine is the raw material donor and the donor of human capital. Because, of course, when you have the underdeveloped production, it means that you have fewer job places and the lower level of the remuneration. That is why millions of Ukrainians are leaving for Poland, for the EU, to earn money and not vice versa. This is the we have different specializations, we have different professions of our economies. And to correct that, it can be done only changing the economic policy, reprogramming the economic policy and changing the profession of the country. Ukraine needs to stop being a donor of raw materials, of talents and hands for the neighboring successful economies. We need to do what they used to do to become successful. That's what mentioned by Professor Reiner today. Just look at this graph. In my opinion, it's just shocking. This is the level of the GDP per capita in Ukraine and the European Union. You can see, for some decades, since 1991, what we can see here. We can see the Euro integration. It's not that easy to see, right? Because we, the Ukrainians, are the Europeans. By civilization, by geography, mentally, but unfortunately, we are far from being Europeans by economy. And gradually our trajectories with Europe are heading the different directions. Instead of the convergence, we have the, uh, the reverse process, and it witnesses about the wrong specialization of our economy and wrong economic policy. We are assured that everything is okay, everything will be super, the economy is growing for several quarters in a row, but you can see everything at this graph. This is the objective data of the World Bank, which cannot be influenced by any propaganda. We are led in the wrong way. So for us to become Europeans without the migration, we need to understand a very simple fact. The ready products cost much more than raw materials, 3, 5, 50 times more. What we Ukrainians are selling all over the world, we are selling, for instance, grain for $7 billion of the US, 5 grivna a kilo. But what's the price of the... Uh, uh, what's the price of all of the flour you can do for of this grain? But we are selling flour for 70 million dollars a year. You can just compare those indicators and then our flour in Turkey in Turkey our grain will become flour and in Italy they will create spaghetti and in the shops you know what prices will be. This is the simple math of poverty and richness. That is why Ukraine is lagging behind Europe five times. Round timber. Why did we ban export of round timber from Ukraine for 10 years? Not only because of environment and ecology, but because of the economic reasons as well. Because we calculated one ton of round timber is $80. What's one ton? This is the cube of $80. How much you can make products of it? Some furnishing cupboards, uh, windows, doors. But if we take furnishing, it's $3,000 a ton. This is the answer where the rich are and why we are still 
poor. The same happens with the metallurgy. Why did we uh, increase the in uh, the customs fee for the scrap metal to become wagons, carriages, wheels. We have the price of $300 a ton, and the cisterns are 3000 So are we so stupid that we cannot produce cisterns on our own? Of course we can. So why should we sell raw materials five times cheaper to Europe and then to buy the ready products from there using international loans? This is the economic idiotism. What's going on here? And we are assured. No, everything is so right. It is approved in the IMF. It is approved abroad. Just listen. You shouldn't be a professor or an academ academic or a ministry of economy. You just have to be sane to understand this simple math. So how we came to this economic gap? We need to leave it. Changing the economic policy. The economic policy is directed for the development of your own production, your own industrial potential. It will allow to speed up the economic growth of Ukraine to 8-10%. This is totally real. Moreover, my esteemed teacher Bogdan Gavrilishin wrote about that even in his report for the Club of Rome. He wrote that for Ukraine to become successful, we need to grow 8 to 10 percent a year of GDP. This is the totally real indicator. If you are in doubts, you may say, Victor, you're a politician, you're the deputy of the leader of the radical party on economic policy, you're a lobbyist of the industry, so you may say that it's possible, but we don't believe you. It cannot happen. Just read the book of Bogdan Havrilishin, read his report for the Club of Rome. And if you don't know the biography of this fantastic person, I do advise you to get acquainted with it. I will never forget how he told me when he was very young and he had to emigrate and he worked as a, a woodchopper and every day he learned by heart at least 20 English words to have better future. And you know whom have he has become? He has become the acting member of the Club of Rome and co-founder of the Davos World Economic Forum and the founder of the International Institute of Management and lots of other institutions all over the world. So everything is possible. Do not believe when they tell, you know, we were programmed by this way, we have to go along this way and nothing is possible to be changed. We should be just, we should feed the Europe and it will make you rich. No, it won't. Those are fairy tales. During the last seven years, the export of the grains grew through times. Who felt it in our economy? Someone felt it, yes. But we need the whole population of Ukraine to fill it, how it's done by Europe. With the help of which, Volodymyr has already mentioned about that, the industrial policy, a very harsh and focused, efficient one, taxation stimulus and investment stimulus for the new production in Ukraine to make the creation of new productions more profitable, industrial parks, the law drafts which we had in the parliament in the first reading, the free connection to the inter engineering networks, one of the main obstacles which are on the way of the Ukrainian economy. Do you hear that on the TV? I don't think you do. But this only law speeds up the growth of our economy. We calculated with the best experts for one, one and a half percent. So you can just add to this share of the economic pie. The export credit agencies, cheaper loans for the Ukrainian producers, not to have 25% of them, but 10%, it's totally real. When you buy Ukrainian and you pay to the Ukrainians, it was mentioned today already, they have the same law in the US since 1933. And now it's the part of the federal legislation on the state procurement, because during the public procurement in 
the U.S., when it's done by the costs of the taxpayers, the advantages of the national producer, the price advantage. The law is working for almost a hundred years, and we're doing that in Ukraine. We are criticized for that by the agents of international and foreign producers who are lobbying the interests of the importers. And it's cool, because when we hear this criticism, we understand that we achieve the aim. And this is the totally similar to the American legislation. As Professor Reinert says, don't listen to foreign advice. To become them, do as they did. Let's have this critical thinking and let's have this scientific and economic approach basing upon empirical data. Dear colleagues, so concluding this small speech, if you're interested, I will tell you where you can read about that in more details, just in a nutshell. For us to speed up the economic growth from 2-3% to 8-10%, as it was mentioned by a big, uh, great Ukrainian Bogdan Gavrilishin, we need to change the structure of the economy. We should stop being raw material colony. We need to change the profession of the country. This is totally possible. How can it be done? Well, of course, nothing will happen on its own. The country can only become the raw materials colony and a supplier. It's very simple. But to become a producer, to become the rich and influential player at the international arena can be done only through the very focused economic policy. As it was said by American researcher and visionary Buckminster Fuller, we have to become architects of our future, not its victims. And for that, the Ukrainian Association of the Club of Rome, together, Rome, together with the Economic Forum, invited you here. That's that's why we're changing the profession of the country, reprogramming the economic policy. And by the way, it was not just an incidental idea for the participants of our conference to come for the results of the ideas of economic growth you offered. This idea will be developed and we'll be speaking about that tonight. But if you're interested with this topic, at my Facebook page I will post an expanded lecture, an expanded presentation on the change of the economic profession of the country. There are more than 40 slides there, which have certain facts and analytics and precise steps and clear steps what to do. If you're interested, add me as a friend on Facebook, the page of Viktor Halasuk in Latin where, uh, ca uh, letters, and you will have more detailed information. Dear colleagues, now this is the end of our first part of our conference, and in half an hour I do invite you to come back here to have a fantastic panel which will be facilitated by Yuri Pivovarov, the executive director of the Kyiv Economic Forum, about the secrets of the successful business from the first hands. You will never hear about that anywhere else. Have a nice coffee break and see you soon. Thank you.